Hello, and welcome to the U Hour brought to you by the University of Miami's Division of Continuing and International Education. I'm your host, Marie Sarkeesian, and we have our producer, Florence Perotti, on the computer. The U Hour is a one hour show designed to inform you about the non credit programs that we have available on our website, which is www.edmiami.com. If you're interested in going back to school to continue your education or to help boost your resume for a new job or promotion, the University of Miami has a lot to offer you. Today we have with us, uh, welcoming back, Margarita Santiago and Pilar Rodriguez from the Human Resource Management Program. And we have two new guests with us today. We have Ken Knox, who is a faculty member and also an attorney. And we have with us Gerlin McIntosh, who is an alumni of the program. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming here today. Uh, let's start out with an introduction with Ken because Ken is the uh, the man of the hour today. We're going to be talking about his classes. So Ken, how long have you been practicing law first of all? 20 years. And how did you get into law and also are you uh, doing anything with HR? Well it's a very long story um, so I won't get into all of it but I will tell you that um, I was a newspaper reporter in Central Florida and uh, I was kind of burned out so I, I wanted to make a career change and uh, I was covering courts and cops uh, in Central Florida and I'd, I'd been a criminal and I knew that wasn't uh, didn't have a long-term future and uh, <laughs> I didn't want to be a, a policeman and so that left an attorney so I decided I'd go to law school so I went to school at Florida State very happy about that and um, went right from there. I went there to be a criminal defense lawyer and was quickly uh, dissuaded from doing that. So I got into uh, labor and employment law and uh, I joined Fisher and Phillips um, right out of law school. So I've been there ever since. And in terms of HR, I've never actually worked in HR, but I mean, I work with uh, HR professionals on a daily basis. And how did you start teaching here at, U at the University of Miami with the Human Resource Program? Uh, our firm has, has had a long-term relationship with the university uh, in this, this program in particular. And Margarita might know better than me, but it's, I think it's been five years, give or take. Uh, but we had a couple of other professors and one of them, uh, a couple of other partners, and one of them decided that he um, uh, was going to ease out of the program. So asked if, uh, if I'd be interested in, uh, in uh, you know, taking over for him. So I did, and then after a, probably about a year or two, the second partner left, and so it's, uh, I've been handling it myself uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you teach two classes in the program. The first one is actually the first class in the program, Legal and re Regulatory Issues. Can somebody, you, if, if, uh, if you want to jump in, tell me why it's so important for human resources, uh, human resource managers to have a good understanding of legal issues? Somebody want to field this, or do you want me to take it? <laughs> okay, feel free. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, even during the time that I've been there, there are so many more laws now that regulate mm -hmm. the employment relationship uh, between employers and employees. And human resource managers, maybe many years ago, uh, <clears throat> an employer could have gotten by with having a payroll clerk handle human resource um, mm -hmm. issues. That's just not sufficient anymore. Um, we are such a litigious society. There are so many lawsuits um, that are filed every day uh, coming out of the employment setting. And so an, an HR professional, while they don't need to be a lawyer, and frankly, I, I don't want the competition, um, but it is important that they at least have an understanding of what uh, uh, some of the laws are that regulate that relationship so that they can help their uh, employer avoid uh, litigation and other legal issues. What are some common legal issues that come up on a day-to-day -day basis for human resources? Well, we've got, um, I mean, I would say on a daily basis, we get, we get calls regarding um, uh, hiring someone who um, has indicated they've got some kind of a disability. And, um, and then the question is, well, what do we do? You know, what, what are we required by the law to do? We get a lot of questions um, routinely about disciplining employees, terminating employees. Mm -hmm. How do we go about it? Is this sufficient grounds to terminate? Um, you know, what should, uh, should we have done something differently? Um, is termination the right thing? Or should we maybe think about something less than that? 
Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, we get calls, our firm does, and I personally do uh, on a daily basis from employers with a lot of just really routine, what, what you would think might be routine employment matters, but because uh, uh, of the fact that there are so many protections out there now, legal protections for employees, uh, employers, it's very important to make sure that they do things right. Mm -hmm. And going back to, uh, Marie, to your original question in terms of why it's so important for human resources, managers, professionals, and even, I would go farther than that, business leaders and, and, and managers overall in a corporation to know about the legal issues. For example, you're in the middle of hiring an individual, like Ken was saying, uh, you can make a very simple mistake by asking the wrong questions during the interview viewing process and that individual might or um, uh, might, might feel discriminated and things like that. So it is critical that we teach our HR managers, like Ken was saying, and maybe probably 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was okay to have a, just a payroll manager on board. But not anymore. It's like every single day you're taking the risk of making a very simple mistake that would definitely impact the bottom line, the business, uh, and cost money to mm -hmm. the organization. So, because just a simple mistake. So I think it is critical, and this is something that we uh, focus in our classes here in the uh, certification, is for all the students to know that um, the importance, how to go about it, and, and what to do in cases like that in order to be proactive, not just reactive mm -hmm. to things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it true that in Florida, mm -hmm. an employer does not have to have a reason to fire an employee? That is true. Um, although, when you think about it, um, how many times do people get fired? I mean, there's, al there's always a reason. Um, and the issue then is, well, is it a good reason? Is it a bad reason? Um, and more importantly, is it an illegal reason? Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the reality is, yeah, if, if, I, if Pilar worked for me and I decide one day that I just don't like that hairdo, um, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna offend her, um, I could just tell her, uh, Pilar, I, I don't want you working for me anymore. Now, my point is that, uh, yeah, um, that's, there is a reason. It's not a very good reason, mm -hmm. um, but it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why, or, or well, first of all, does this happen a lot in in jobs? Where or do you see that happen, where people just get fired with no reason? Well, from my perspective, and and, and, and Pilar can address it too. In my experience, there's always a reason, mm -hmm. um, and and the issue is trying to figure out what that what that reason is. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the bigger uh, the bigger issue is not whether there's a reason. The bigger issue for a lot of the, the employers I deal with is what do we tell the employee? You know, mm -hmm. do, we, do we tell them a reason? Do we have to tell them a reason? Mm -hmm. And legally, um, there is no uh, requirement for an employer to give an employee a reason for being terminated. If I just want to say to Pilar, I don't want you working for me anymore, that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. So legally, that's not an issue. Now, as a practical matter, I think that is a big issue because Pilar then is going to say, well, now wait a second. Everything was hunky dory until this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what happened, and you know whenever whenever we don't know something, I think it's just a natural tendency for human beings to fill in the blanks themselves, mm -hmm. and we all do it. Um, and we sit there and we think, well, you know, what could the reason be? And Pilar starts thinking, well, uh, is it because I'm a woman, <clears throat> or is it because I'm Hispanic? And that's, those are the only things I can think of because my employer didn't give me any, any good reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's, you know, uh, in particular, it's very easy to just um, pick up the phone book and call an attorney and say, I just got fired, they didn't give me a reason, um, and I'm trying to figure it out. And there are plenty of attorneys out there that will help you try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And that's not what an employer wants to have to deal with. Right, is what we call the uh, employment at will. Uh, it, uh, Basically, it's what Ken is saying. It's like, for no reason, you know, in Florida, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But we all go, we always go back to the uh, what is the right thing to do for the organization? What is the message that you're sending to all the employees that uh, people are being fired just for whatever? 
that that is not the right thing to do and and that it will eventually uh, be detrimental to the uh, to the organization mm -hmm. and to the business and to the morale and all those things will eventually uh, once again impact the money mm -hmm. the productivity mm -hmm. the profit of a business right because then you you <clears throat> might have attrition maybe people might say hmm you know things are happening like this with no reason I don't trust this company right there you have an issue then it's gonna you're gonna have to restaff that is the cost so you see it's mm -hmm. like a domino effect mm -hmm. so uh, that it going back to your question does it happen every day yes and Ken, you're a lawyer, and he can, he probably gets a lot of calls. Mm -hmm. it, it happens. Uh, what can we do? Well, as an HR manager, uh, at least uh, where I've been and my experience is, uh, always try to do the right thing right. Mm -hmm. Always try to keep the integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the things that you can control? Well, I can control one, two, and three, fine. Talk to your team and HR. Make sure that you talk to your HR, uh, to your business leaders. They understand the implication of, um, you know, a woman being pregnant. But don't fire somebody that is pregnant just because, or things like that, or because of the maternity. Uh, so always do what you have under your control, which mm -hmm. is the education, the communication. Make sure that people are aware. How is it that in our companies? What are the values that we have in our company? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like as an HR, it's very important to know those legal issues that, yes, you don't have to give a reason as a, an employer in Florida, but especially for HR, it's important to know that if the employee is not satisfied with the reason why, they might go to get legal advice or counsel, and, oh, then, you, and then you might have a lawsuit on your hands. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, and I can tell you, I do that almost every day of my life. Because every day as business partner or HR generalist, whatever the name, you know, whatever they want to call us, but as an HR manager, every day you have to deal with the business leaders. And that's the first thing, that when they come to your office and they say, hey, Pilar, I have this problem, this issue with this employee, the first thing that I'm, you know, okay, so let's take a look at all the facts. What are the things? No, I need to fire this individual. No, 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 wait, wait a second. What is the reason? Why? What, what is basically... The, the 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 background here mm -hmm. right girl and I know that you work in the HR department at Norwegian Cruise Lines is that right, right. Mm -hmm. have do you have um, any experience with that kind of issue where maybe somebody might have been fired um, without a reason where they might have sought legal counsel that either you tried to prevent or you usually just go ahead and give a good reason or okay. well in the, in my current position now um, what I'm mostly faced with is um, the with the pre preliminary um, experience. If someone has been discriminated, they'll come up to me and ask me, "Is this legal? Um, mm -hmm. What should I do?" And based on whatever I recommend, I try to avoid them from going that route. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what I would rec recommend to them is very important, so it doesn't get higher than it should mm -hmm. in the ranks mm -hmm. in so, the department. So. so in that case, you do need to have that kind of legal background to be able to tell them. Definitely. And that's one of the reasons why I looked into I looked into taking this course. Right. Because of all of those questions that were coming to me, I didn't want to go ahead and um, assist anybody in the wrong manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. What is the fastest growing area of employment litigation, especially in South Florida? Uh, lawsuits brought under the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. That's a uh, that's a statute. It's been around <coughs> since 1938, but it requires employers to do a number of things, including uh, and these are probably concepts that are be most familiar to uh, to most viewers. Would be you've got to pay your employees who are not exempt uh, at least uh, the minimum wage, whether it's. Uh, the Florida minimum wage or the federal mm -hmm. minimum wage, whichever is higher. And if they're not exempt mm -hmm. uh, and they work more than 40 hours in a week, you're required to pay them time and a half, one and one and a half times their regular rate of pay for any hours they work in excess of that. Mm -hmm. If I if I could just, just add something real quick, mm -hmm. and, and I know we all do this, all of the instructors, but um, the way I approach my the courses that I teach, particularly the first one, which is legal and regulatory issues, is to um, 
I try to impress upon all the students that look, as far as I'm concerned, you are professionals in, in, in this particular field. And, or you will be professionals in this particular field. And what I want to try to, what I, what I always try to accomplish is to give them the legal basis so that they, they understand again that there are laws out there, there are certain things they can, cannot do, should, should not do. And my goal is for when they leave that class, um, for them to be a valuable, uh, maybe this is demeaning and I don't mean it to be, but a valuable commodity. Mm -hmm. um, because so many times, um, and I think it's, it's less so now, but certainly in the past, human resources was kind of treated as a necessary evil by, by some of the employers. And managers would make decisions and human resources would find out about it after the fact and it's mm -hmm. often too late then. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I try to do and what I think we try to do as a program is to give the, uh, the students the, the skills to be able to uh, be more valuable to their employer and to mm -hmm. get involved. And so that, you know, in, a, in, a, in an ideal situation, whether it's disciplines or terminations or even hiring decisions, all of that should go through human resources, mm -hmm. through somebody who's, who's got the knowledge who can who can look at a situation and say, wait a second, that's that's not quite right. Um, rather than leaving things up to your frontline supervisors to make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's valuable to the company monetarily as well to be able to handle these situations in house instead of having to go to legal representation for any any one question that might pop up. Where if a human resource manager just knew the answer, they wouldn't have to go that route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and going back to what Ken was saying, and I always say it and say it and say it again in, in my classes also, is uh, you might probably hear the term of business partner uh, for the HR generalist, like I said before. And, and what does that mean? That means that um, we're, not, we're costing money to the organization because they have to pay for our salaries, right? as mm -hmm. HR manager, so it, it has a cost for, for the company. But uh, as long as the CEO and, and, and the business leaders see that I am there helping him, making decisions, coaching him, mm -hmm. not just taking orders, mm -hmm. okay, and coaching them in order to make things happen, they will see the value. Mm. And I think that is something that we really, all of us, all the professors and with, with, uh, with the program, we emphasize. What is the new role of HR, of an HR manager? What are the things that we really, you know, why do we exist, right? And what are the things that you're gonna learn in the certification? That is basically one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and because it is a tremendous value right now. Maybe years ago, maybe they didn't see that much of an importance. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's critical to have a capable uh, HR manager in-house. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I see this. Absolutely. I don't know what was your, what's your feeling. On, no, I definitely agree. It, um, well, in my case, it's helped me assess situations a lot, dif you know, differently, <clears throat> as well as build my confidence in um, suggesting new ways to um, do certain things that we were doing in our department and to other departments. Mm -hmm. And it has also helped me understand why certain um, procedures or policies are in place. Mm -hmm. And in me understanding this, when people come to me and ask me questions, I can go ahead and answer it a lot clearer for them because they're intimidated to go to management at times, so they come to me. And knowing the answers is definitely a plus. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. I see it as a way of solving a small problem before it becomes a bigger problem. Definitely. Of course, definitely. definitely. Mm -hmm. See, and, that's, and that to me is one of the, <clears throat> probably the biggest hurdles uh, for, for an HR professional to overcome, and that is um, uh, demonstrating Mm -hmm. uh, his or her value to the employer. And, and, and I say that in this regard. <clears throat> if you've got somebody who's in charge of producing so many uh, you know, pieces of paper in an hour or something, you can look at what they've produced after a period of time and you can say, well, this is, this is valuable to me. Um, with HR, oftentimes you can't do that because the value is in how many lawsuits did I help my employer avoid? How many EOC charges did I help my employer avoid? How many 
uh, conflicts in the workplace. You know, did mm -hmm. I help uh, my employer avoid? And you can't, it's, you know, how do you measure that? You know, mm -hmm. it's like, um, you know, it's very difficult. But that to me, that's, that's a lot of the value of, an, of a good HR mm -hmm. professional mm -hmm. is to be able to uh, keep the employer from spending money that they, that, you know, they, they wouldn't, uh, don't need to spend. It sounds like the problem would be a good HR representative in a company would avoid problems and so the company's saying, oh, I don't have any problems. Exactly. What's even the point I'm of HR? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. I agree also that the role of the HR manager goes beyond that because it brings a good balance to the company mm -hmm. as a business partner. So that's another added value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it is in, incredible the feeling that when you go to, to, to the business leader, the CEO of that company and say, hey, by the way, we just saved $150,000 just because you didn't fire this individual and this is how I help you, right? right. Uh, but it's true, that is the case. And mm -hmm. I always say that. It's like as long as we are good marketers of what we produce, as like what Ken was saying, it's so difficult to measure what we do. It's like mm -hmm. you can go, it can go the whole day by, it goes by, and then you say, my God, I'm so tired, but what did, what did I do? You did a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. you, 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 as an HR manager, you did a lot, but the thing mm -hmm. is that you need to learn how to quantify right. for, the, for the company. Did you notice that after you finished your course at Norwegian that no, the actual company was able to see a measurable difference? Definitely, <laughs> definitely that you say that. Um, during the course, actually, I started um, becoming more involved in decision making and just helping my vice president a lot more in his particular role, just taking more things on myself. Like I said before, it does build your confidence mm -hmm. that you're able to exec um, execute situations in the correct fashion. Um, so. It's just such a plus to take mm -hmm. this course. It makes you more um, proactive versus being reactive to situations. Mm -hmm. right. What are some of the most common mistakes employers can lead uh, that, that can happen that could lead to FLSA lawsuits? Probably one of the biggest ones is misclassifying your, your employees. Under, under that particular statute, um, if an employee is not exempt, then they're required to get at least a minimum wage and then time and a half the regular rate for anything over 40. And the big question is, well, what makes an employee exempt? And so one of the biggest problem, one of the biggest mistakes is employers classifying their employees as exempt when in fact they really are not. Mm -hmm. So for example, there are still employers out there that think if I have someone that works in the office and I pay them a salary, then I can work them as many hours as I want, and then mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about overtime. That simply isn't true. Um, the law is uh, designed to afford wage protection to to a large number of uh, of employees, and so there are some exemptions um, that an employer can uh, can avail himself of to avoid things like the minimum wage obligation, the overtime obligation. But um, those exemptions are real narrow. And so, and, and the burden is on the employer to establish that they're really exempt. So what happens uh, oftentimes is an, an employer has, say, a receptionist or, or maybe uh, his secretary. And um, she works, you know, routinely, 50, 60 hours a week doing things. He puts on a salary. She doesn't keep any time records. So, um, you know, there's no, there's no proof as to how many hours she actually worked. And... Um, Often that situation is fine. Everybody's happy with it until the assistant is terminated. Hmm. And that person's terminated and uh, she's unhappy about it or he's unhappy about it. They go to an attorney and one of the questions that a, a, an attorney would ask is, well, how were you compensated? What did you do? And they'll find out that this person wasn't exempt, that they should have been paid overtime and were not. Hmm. Um, and the next thing you know, the employer gets served with a lawsuit saying that for the last three years, uh, this employee averaged 55 hours a week and uh, wasn't paid overtime, and you owe her the overtime now. And there were no time records, so it's the employer saying, you know, well, uh, she didn't work that many hours, and the former employee saying that she did. That's one of the big ones. 
Um, another big one is uh, not keeping accurate time records. The law requires an employer to keep accurate time records of the hours worked by its employees. And uh, a lot of times employers simply don't do that. Now some employers don't do it because they don't think about it. Some employers are in industries where it's tough to do. Construction, you know, when you've got roofers, you don't have those folks clock in and out. Mm -hmm. um, but those are, those are two of the big ones. Mm -hmm. Pilar Gerland, do you have any examples of common mistakes employers do? Well, I, I have to agree with, with Ken, and that is a very fine line because I, I know, and, and my experience is, it's, it's difficult to measure, especially with the, the cases of secretary, and that has been my experience. Uh, there's forms and there's like a formula um, that, uh, that you have to fill out and you have to ask yourself some questions about that particular position that helps you understand and classify that individual um, uh, correctly. For example, where I work, HSBC, uh, we have a very strict uh, procedure process and, and we went through, you know, usually every year you have to go through an audit and make sure that everybody is uh, correctly classified, etc. Um, but for me, my particular experience has been really who is exempt and who is non-exempt. It's, it's, it's a tricky uh, issue, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the topics that are covered in this course, legal and regulatory issues? Um, well, we talk about at-will employment, that theory, which is, which is simply that um, unless there's a contract for a specified period of time, um, the, the typical employment relationship is at will, which means that the employer or the employee, either one, can end it at any time for any reason or no reason, as long as it's not an illegal reason. So we, we really start from that, and then we spend a lot of time talking about, and we don't talk about every law that uh, has an impact on the employment relationship because um, I just don't have the time. I mean, we, we just don't as a program. Um, but we try to hit on some of the, some of the more significant um, uh, statutes like the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, Title mm -hmm. VII, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, things like that. So I try to give the students a basis there. And then we talk about, and, and one of the things I always try to do too is to give uh, the students not only that legal background but some practical advice on, on you know how you go about making sure that you avoid some of those uh, some of those issues um, so we talk about uh, what are the uh, appropriate ways to uh, interview uh, potential employees uh, how do you discipline the importance of documentation um, you know how do you handle terminations which you know it's a fact of life those things happen mm -hmm. um, you know things like that and um, I don't know. Hopefully, I'm successful. But now we can put the pressure on Berlin. And she can say whether, whether we are or not. You know. No, definitely. That class was extremely um, important to me to know what my rights were as an individual, you know, and mm -hmm. also um, personally, and and also in my my work, in my position, mm -hmm. and to be able to advise everybody else what their rights are as well, mm -hmm. but not overstepping my. Um, my ground <laughs> because if not I can get my employer in trouble and you know it kind of measures what I can and cannot say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Florence do we have a question from the chat room? Yes we do. Um, the first question we have is mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. of the human resource management program consists of legal lectures? It is two courses the opening and the closing, which is dedicated totally to the law, employee and labor relations, and uh, legal and regulatory issues. And how many classes uh, for each course? Each course is 10 class meetings for a total of 60 hours. Thank you. Sure. Let's move on to the other class that you teach, which is employee and labor relations. Um, I know earlier you were t discussing a lot about unions in that class. First of all, could you describe what a union is and do we have them in Florida? Uh, yeah, a union is an organization of workers or employees that's formed to promote the, uh, the members' interests in terms of things like wages and working conditions. 
So, uh, you know, back in the, in, in the 1930s in particular, um, uh, well, even prior to that, um, uh, there were horrible working conditions, especially in manufacturing plants, things like that. And a lot of these laws that we talk about, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and, and of course that's one of the older ones, but, but even before that, um, a lot of these laws simply weren't in place. And so uh, employees were really uh, working at the mercy of their employer. And so, of course, um, uh, workers decided, you know, if we don't really have any power, or very little power, as individuals, but as a group. Um, that may give us some uh, ability to level the playing field, so to speak. Um, now, union, unions uh, and membership in unions has uh, declined since the peak was about the mid-50s. We definitely have unions in Florida. Um, probably, I would say that most people are familiar with things like the firefighters unions and uh, teachers unions and uh, police unions. So those are all public, um, you know, public employees. Um, Florida is not a very strong union state in terms of private employers. You know, places like, uh, on the contrary, would be places like New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, places like that. But, uh, and so because of that, um, I would say that while the majority of the students in legal and regulatory issues class, they've at least heard of a lot of the laws we talk about. When we get into the, the, that last module, um, the idea of unions and union organizing is a really a foreign concept. And so, but I will say that in the past year, and I think going forward, it'll become more important because there's legislation out there that if it is passed, uh, would make it much easier for um, uh, employees of private employers to, uh, to organize a union. Do you think that's gonna be passed sometime soon? I don't know. Uh, what, uh, the statute I'm talking about, or the, the bill, uh, is the Employee Free Choice Act. Mm. Uh, right now, typically, the, the process in place is if, um, if I'm an employer and my employees decide they, they want to be represented by a union, what usually happens is uh, they will sign authorization cards. They'll submit that to a federal agency called the National Labor Relations Board. And um, if there's enough, if they get enough cards signed, um, they present them and um, a petition is filed and then typically what happens is there's an election and it's a, and so there's a period of time where the union can campaign and try to convince the employees mm -hmm. that they need a union and the employer has the opportunity to campaign and try to convince employees that a union is not necessary. If the Employee Free Choice Act were to pass in its, in, in its current form, um, it would uh, eliminate the, uh, the election process so that what would be required is employ if, if employees could get authorization cards signed by a majority of the employees, they would submit it to the National Labor Relations Board and, 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 and the union's in place. And so now the employer would not have any opportunity to, to, you know, to, to try to campaign to against it. They would simply now be required to negotiate. So well, if it gets yeah. passed, it sounds like there's going to be a lot more unions out there. Certainly could Definitely. be. Certainly <laughs> could be. You know, the, the process would be much easier. Now, you know, the unions uh, have said that the reason for this is they believe that the current process is weighted toward the employers. And of course, as you can imagine, employers would disagree with that. Um, but this whole issue about, and, and you may also hear the term card check, and, and that's what they're talking about too, is is um, uh, recognize, recognition of a union simply based on the signing of authorization cards. Um, and that was, frankly, that was an issue here a number of years ago with um, uh, Unico, uh, a contractor at the University of Miami and, and its workforce. Hmm. Is Florida a right to work state? And can you also define what that term means? It, it is, and, and um, well, right to work simply means that a state cannot require uh, an employee to be a member of a union to either get a job or keep a job. All right, so that's what right to work means. And Florida is a right to work state. So here, um, uh, and, and, and understand there's a difference between being a, being a union member and being represented by a union. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if let's say the, the five of <clears throat> us, um, we could all be working for an employer and we could be represented by a union. 
I might be a member. I might choose to pay my union dues and maybe be a shop steward. Gerlin might decide to do that, but the, but the other three of you might decide, eh, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna join. But you're still, even if you don't join, the five of us still would be represented by the union in terms of negotiations with the employer. Right, mm -hmm. right. Is it true that if an employer fires an employee within the first 90 days of employment, that the employer doesn't have to worry about being sued for discrimination or for any other reason? No. <laughs> um, some employers think that's the case. Some employers think that there's that in the first 90 days, somehow this employee has lesser rights um, or lesser legal protections than they do starting with day 91, and that's, that's not true. Um, if the employment relationship is at will, it's at will whether it's in the first 90 days or, or beyond. And uh, an employer is not permitted to illegally discriminate against an employee whether they're in the probationary period or not. Mm -hmm. The only legal significance to 90, and, and frankly an employer down here in Florida can have any kind of probationary or introductory period they want. It could be 90 days, 30 days, 120 days. The only significance of 90 days is that for unemployment compensation purposes, if an employee is terminated in the first 90 days of employment for poor performance, that employer's account is not charged you know, for um, if, if the employee subsequently collects benefits. But that's the only significance of that 90-day uh, period. Is that the same at Norwegian? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Given the increased enforcement of a country's immigration laws regarding illegal immigrants, would it be wise for an employer to require job applicants to produce specific documents? No. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Um, that, that's one of the things that we cover in, uh, in legal and regulatory issues, too, are the, some of the immigration laws. Now, I'm not an expert in, in, in immigration uh, law, but uh, we certainly cover some of the basics. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're talking about, you know, currently, if someone wants a job, and I'm sure Gerlin had to do it, um, but when you, shortly after you apply, and, and if you're hired, you have to complete an I-9 form. Right. And, and if you look at the form, on the back of it, there's different columns and mm -hmm. different documents you can produce. Mm -hmm. um, the employee can decide which of those documents, you know, either one from this column or one from each of these two. They're the ones that decide what they're going to present. Right. And the employer's only uh, real obligation is to look at those documents, and if they appear legitimate on their face, that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, if an employer says, you know what, I don't want to take a chance, so anybody that wants a job here is going to have to produce a Social Security card uh, and something else, um, that's what's called document abuse, and that's illegal. So uh, an employer simply presents the I-9 form, the employee looks at what's what he can produce, and then he decides what to produce it. Mm -hmm. And if it's legitimate, then the employer is required to accept it. He can't say, well, I know there's a list of five things here, but this is the one I want. Mm -hmm. right, that, that would be legal. So going back to what you just said earlier, is the only verification of the HR person looking at the actual document saying, yes, this is, this is a real document, and checking off that they brought in whatever they wanted? There's there's no other process of verifying, I, because it was brought up with uh, illegal immigrants. What if they have forged documents? What happens then? Well, that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a, a, a federal program called E-Verify, which uh, applies right now to government contractors, but the government's trying to encourage private employers to uh, participate in this thing too, which is to, it still doesn't, it doesn't regulate the, the documents that the employee produces or the potential employee produces, but it, it allows the employer um, uh, to be able to determine uh, relatively early on whether um, uh, a social security number that's given by the employee, for example, is legitimate mm -hmm. or not. Um, and, uh, you know, for years, uh, Social Security uh, Administration has been sending out um, letters to employers, which says, you know, you've got this employee or these employees, their Social Security number that you submitted to us doesn't match the records we have. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the person's Ill an illegal immigrant, mm -hmm. but it does now put the employer on notice that um, there's a potential issue here. Mm -hmm. So that's really the only way that an employer would know if the documents presented to them were true or not. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I had a I had a situation many many years ago in uh, where was it? It was in the uh, in, 
Okeechobee, I think it was. And what we had there was we had a, a human resource director who was very good, um, but probably a little zealous. And she knew that you know there were fraudulent documents out there. Mm -hmm. And she would get these documents and she would do then her own investigation in terms of whether they were legitimate for each employee or not. Mm -hmm. and, and that's simply illegal. If you look at it and it appears legitimate, you know, you accept it. Mm -hmm. If there's some reason that it is not, that it does not appear to be legitimate, then you can, you can reject it, but you can't do your own private investigation to try to figure out whether that's a fraudulent document or not. That's interesting. I did not mm -hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are, the, what are some of the other topics that are covered in employee and labor relations? Um, we talk about things uh, in there like uh, how to conduct an internal investigation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Gerlin um, certainly <coughs> maybe has been required and, and I'm sure in the future will be at some point. But you know, you may get an employee who comes to you and says, I've been sexually harassed by somebody. Um, well, uh, you could reach out to uh, an outside attorney. I volunteer, um, <laughs> you know, to conduct that investigation. But um, you know, a lot of HR professionals will conduct those things, those investigations internally. Mm -hmm. So we talk about, you know, how, you know, how do you go about doing that? Um, we talk about um, uh, OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, and in fact, I just coming up here, I was uh, a little bit late getting up here because I had a an informal conference at OSHA. Uh, this morning, which I dealt with that and then got in the road to come down here. So we talk about that, um, uh, you know, and, and, and how you try to keep your uh, your workplace uh, safe, free of hazards, and if OSHA comes in and issues some kind of a citation for uh, some kind of safety violations, you know, how you deal with that, things like that. But I, but the bulk of it really has to do with, um, with dealing with unions. You know, what are unions? Um, what is the process? You know, what can employers say or do? Because a lot of times uh, you'll get an employer who uh, gets a petition uh, for an election from the National Labor Relations Board, and they simply freak out, um, or their their supervisors freak out, and they're they don't know what they can say, they don't know what they can do, and they're afraid that if they say something, it'll be the wrong thing. And so we talk about you know how you you know what are the limits uh, in things you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, but that's generally it. Mm -hmm. Now, Gerlin, you're an alumni of the certificate program. Mm -hmm. What made you search it out and decide to take the certificate? Um, actually, the way that I found out about it was listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a point in my life that I really needed a change. I, I wanted to go back to college, but I couldn't afford um, other programs. This is a very inexpensive way and a very effective um, program to take if you're looking into HR. Why were you thinking about going back to school? To further enhance my career. Were you having issues at work where you felt like you needed to just know a little bit more to either, was it for promotion or? No, actually I just wanted to be challenged. No. Oh. I wanted to be challenged and definitely this program was very challenging. Mm -hmm. It's, I looked into the two month programs but there was just too little time. Mm -hmm. And um, this one it gives you a university setting. Mm -hmm. You do speeches, essays. You you have all of the the laws that you learn by, and it's it's just a longer process, but a more effective process mm -hmm. in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do all the students that take the certificate class are they all already in the HR field, or do some of them come in fresh without any knowledge? We have both. Most of the students are in the HR industry, but also those newcomers. Since this is UM and we have small classes, mm -hmm. the faculty has the opportunity to really give detailed attention to individuals, which in other Definitely. cases, uh, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But yes, in our program. Mm -hmm. Right, you fall through the cracks at times when you're in a mm -hmm. class or you're too embarrassed mm -hmm. to um, raise your hand if you're too shy, but in this, um, you're with the same people for so many months that you build a bond with everyone and with the professors as well mm -hmm. that even after the program I still speak to several of them. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely, um, it was definitely exciting and positive experience. Was there a particular class or lecture or project that really helped you in your job? That helped me in my job was 
doing um, the, the PowerPoint projects and speaking in front of the classroom. That was very difficult for me. Um, very nerve-wracking mm -hmm. to to speak to everyone and to tell them what I you know what I do or just to tell them the ideas that I have for for different projects that we were given mm -hmm. by all the different professors each one of them was beneficial mm -hmm. I can't just pick a favorite I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> uh, my heart's been broken many sorry. times before <laughs> we, we the last time. how did you apply that that experience of speaking in front of your classmates to Norwegian um, in the position, like I mm -hmm. said before, in the position that I am in as an executive assistant, many of the, the employees in our department come to me. Mm -hmm. They come to me to, to speak to the other managers. So when I'm in when, you know, the meetings, I'm a lot more verbal. Mm -hmm. And I'm more confident in what I'm saying to them. And I know what, my, you know, what I can and cannot say without stepping on any toes. <laughs> and it just um, it definitely just makes everything a lot more positive. It, help, it allows me to help the employees without exposing the management. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that some of the information was a refresher for what you already knew or was a lot of it new information that you were learning? A lot of it was new information, especially the laws. Mm -hmm. The laws, you know, you, you know that the laws exist, but you just don't know as to why did they come about? How do they apply to you? Mm -hmm. um, and in your day to day, sometimes you're you're faced in situations that you're you yourself are being discriminated against, and you just never really would have paid any mind to it, really, or even thought you had a right to even question it. But in taking these courses, it definitely gives you that power to know what people can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you take it again? Definitely. <laughs> I think it, there's so much. There's so much that you have to learn and retain that I would definitely take it again. Mm -hmm. Well, then it sounds like you guys do a good job. <laughs> do you guys Hopefully. usually bring in current events and topics into the classroom? Oh, definitely. I, I think right. uh, from my perspective, I think one, one of the... Th one of our objectives with, with the program is basically to make it real life. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that is our main goal for all of us, for Margarita as the program coordinator and, and, and us, the, the, the faculty. And that's why we have uh, all the modules organized and we have the uh, uh, case study that we go through every single class. You learn a piece of that big pie and it helps you put into practice what you're hearing, what you're learning, mm -hmm. uh, the exercise in the class, the time that you have at the end of the class to work on your projects, and then at the end you see the final thing. Mm -hmm. At the end you see that, if, for example, in my class compensation, then you learn about the compensation piece, and can you learn the, the law, then when you take the training, then you learn about the training. So at the end of the certification, you have uh, multiple uh, projects, but it's the same thing. It's the same case study, it's the same uh, example. Mm -hmm. Most of, if, if I could throw this in, mo um, I do a lot of different things, Fisher and Phillips, but primarily I'm a litigator. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time either in court or, you know, in, in doing things in connection with the cases that have been filed. And so I, I try not to simply make the course a uh, just a, a, a panoply of, um, of war stories. But w what I do try to bring to the, to the class is we talk about the law, we talk about how it applies, and then, um, because I've been doing this for so long, uh, you know, I'm able, in most cases, to be able to, to say to the students, now here's a practical example mm -hmm. of, of what can go wrong or, you know, or, or how this can actually play out. And, um, and just in, and in the years I've been doing this, I know there are times when I've talked about the law and I look out there and, you know, people are, you know, making faces or taking down notes or whatever. And I talk about how it applies and they're doing the same. But then when you tell a story about, you know, how this can, how something can really get screwed up, uh, it's amazing to look out and see the reaction on people's faces, you know, thinking, wow, you know, this, this really is a big deal. And, and, you know, so try to do that to impress upon the fact that, you know, this is not ivory tower stuff. This is stuff that you, as HR professionals, will be dealing with every single day. Mm -hmm. Are students such as yourself who already had an HR background, are they able to bring their personal experiences into the classroom as well to maybe work those out as examples? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I encourage 
uh, students to do that. You know, if they've got something that they can talk about, and even if I didn't encourage it, you know, there's a lot of students that uh, mm -hmm. they have no problem just volunteering, <laughs> you know. And so, but that's good. And, and, and a lot of times, too, we'll get a back and forth in the class. And it won't just be me talking. I mean, granted, I'm an, I'm an attorney, so I can, I can talk as long as he'll you know, let me. Um, but what I really enjoy is when I get in, something started and then, you know, Gerlin talks about her experience and then somebody else talks about theirs and someone else talks about theirs. And, uh, you, you know, everybody now gets involved. And, and I think that's good, not just for the experienced folks, but it's, it's good for those newcomers, you know, who... who think HR sounds interesting, they don't really know too much about it, they want to learn about it, they haven't really had, um, you know, much experience in that. And then when they hear from me, and, and, and even more so, they hear from their, uh, from their peers, um, I think that really resonates with them. Mm -hmm. It clears a lot of misconceptions that you may have mm. about situations. You may think something's legal and it really isn't. Right. Mm -hmm. So it definitely gives you that, you know, background, you know, that foundation. Mm -hmm. Florence, do we have another question from the chat room? We have several <laughs> questions about <laughs> the, the actual program, when it starts, when the next start is after March, um, about the faculty, uh, whether they specialize in a specific area. Um, well, what, what so if you could fill yeah. us in a little bit about the program and then you know, I can let you know the questions that haven't been right. covered. Let's start out with uh, when is the next program starting and how often does it run? Okay, our program is scheduled to start in spring and fall, which is going to be March 1st, next week on Monday. That will be our spring start, and the fall will be October 5th. Mm -hmm. The program runs for about eight to nine months. In spring, we have Mondays and Wednesdays class from 6 to 9 p.m., and the fall program goes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, also at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everyone can see the schedule online and also where to enroll if they're so interested on our website, which is edmiami.com slash HRM, short for Human Resource Management. Absolutely. Uh, Florence, what was the question about the faculty? They'd like to know if uh, the faculty members in the Human Resource Management program specialize in specific areas. Absolutely, <coughs> yes. Each of the faculty is an expert in those areas. Like compensations, we have Ken Knox for the legal and regulatory issues in employee and labor relations. We have Dr. Nadine Maidwin for the training and development. And we have another professor, Juan Kelly, which is um, his, his, yeah, for benefits. Mm -hmm. He comes from the very good uh, background of the CEBS, which is Certified Employee Benefit Specialist. So, each of them, you know, in their own expertise. And Pilar, why don't you say what your expertise is? Oh, basically, um, I, I teach. I'm responsible for teaching the, uh, the compensation, uh, developing compensation structure. Uh, I've been in HR for 20, 21 years. Um, I'm a generalist myself. Uh, I've been in different fields of HR. Um, I, I, I basically enjoy, uh, and I have enjoyed my career in HR uh, tremendously, and, and I consider, and I always say this, it is my passion because I, I, I believe that um, uh, we can bring value, like we said before, we can add value to the organization and, and basically, but well, mostly I, I see everything. Right now my job, and for the last 10, 15 years I've been an HR generalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are the name of the classes you teach? Uh, compensation, the developing uh, and administration of compensation structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did we have any other questions to that? Yes, we do. Uh, the, we have two more, and I'll, I'll give them both to you so you can answer them. The first one was, do all of the coursing, courses in the program need to be taken consecutively? And the second is, are the course materials covered in the course fees? Yes, uh, this is a lockstep program. So it does need to be taken consecutively. Mm -hmm. And the materials, yes, they are included within the tuition fees. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions from the chat? Uh, it seems that you've covered most of it. Um, so I think uh, if there are any well, other questions about the structure of the program, it would be best to visit the website or, right. or give um, us a call. 
Well, I have a couple more questions. So, sure. uh, how much does it cost, and do you offer payment plans? Yes, we do. It is three thousand two hundred ninety-five dollars. That covers the entire program, mm -hmm. one year membership to the Society for Human Resources Management, and we also offer payment plans. Mm -hmm. And is this program supported by Gymsherm? Yes, it is. And what? Are, or can you give a little explanation of uh, what Gymsherm is? Sure, that's the Society for Human Resources Management, which is an authority in the industry, and they have been very supportive of our program and the curriculum, and we've been associated to the gym shrimp also, and our curriculum prepares the student to take the professional human resources certificate and the senior professional professional human resources certificate so that's what we do in the program right and you can or they don't have to take the certificate if they don't want to but the class will prepare them for it absolutely the curriculum does mm -hmm. yeah do we have a, any other questions in the chat room no, we don't. all right well thank you florence and thank you to our listeners for listening to this installment of the u hour and to all of our guests for coming with us today uh, remember, if you need to find out any other information about the Human Resource Management Program, you can visit our website, which is www.edmiami.com slash HRM, short for Human Resource Management. And I want to remember everyone that it is the U, and it's all about you. <laughs>